what a literature review is, but why we need a literature review. Why do we need to recognize the existence of the literature? And part of the answer is going to go back into this graph that I, into this image that I have right here, the, this, uh, the synapsis. In order, this is, this is your, let's say this is your proposal. This is your project. You need to be able to recognize how this little dot that you have right here is connected to the larger structure or to the larger scheme or to the larger, to the bigger picture, if you will. And um, that is one of the main purposes of the literature review is to give yourself and give people who look at your work a sense of structure and a sense of direction and in how your proposal fits within a larger field of study. And that's, the, that's, that's important. So let's just look for a second. Um, this is the last slide I have for today. It's not because I wanna go into little by little of this. Uh, and we write literature reviews in order to really situate multiple dimensions of the research problem. So in this definition by Lumbo and Irby, uh, they provide 10 aspects. That we, so we're gonna just, um, look at them one by one and see how that works. So um, first of all, they say, well, you need to provide a historical background. When I say provide a historical background, or I, uh, we're talking about recognizing that a research problem is something, as, as we said in the, in the previous class, uh, in the previous sessions two weeks ago, that there is, a hist um, there is a historical dimension to the work and there's a historicity to the phenomena. So it means that whatever you want to study is something that may, it's very probable that it didn't just come out this year, that there could be evidence five, 10 years in the past that this is a, this is a, a problem that deserves to be an object of inquiry. So it's important to recognize the work that other people have done in the sense that, as we said, as we talked about, in the, again, in the very first sessions of our research course, um, the notion of originality doesn't necessarily mean it's completely unprecedented. Sometimes the idea of originality has to do with how I tackle the problem on a, in a different context, uh, in a different field, in a different content area, uh, how I, but in order for me to be able to find that angle, that new original angle to tackle the problem, I need to understand that this, I mean, there is the historical element. In, I need to know, okay, what people have done in this field. So if I want to go in a different direction, first I need to know what people did. I cannot, and I cannot, and research in general is historical. You cannot do research from a historical perspective. I mean, you cannot start thinking of a social phenomenon without recognizing its past, its present, and its future. It's, it's really difficult. And especially when you're dealing with social research or educational research, you need to situate it in the past, the present, and the future. So it's important to have the historical perspective to really have a grasp of what people have done in the field for the past five, the past 10, the past 20. Um, once you get deeper in the field, the new comprehension has to go back maybe 50 years, 100 years in order to really be able to say, oh yeah, that's a, that's a subject, that's a topic, that's a theme worth exploring or worth inquiring. Sometimes realizing that there are topics that uh, are cyclical in nature, and then there are topics that disappear for 20, 30 years, and then they become relevant. So, but you cannot know if a topic you're exploring is relevant because it's current or is relevant because it's part of, it's part of these cycles of um, information flow if you have not explored and you have not inquired the literature. Then uh, we talk about describing its, its status of the, of the problem. 
So again, it goes back into the previous point. Is it a relevant topic? Is it a topic that really based on the, um, what the literature, what the what different styles are saying, is it something that is worth pursuing? Um, sometimes, and we as researchers have to be realistic um, that sometimes just because it's a topic I want to explore, and now doesn't mean I should explore it right this moment. Part of understanding and part of developing a research agenda is knowing what I can study today and knowing what I should study tomorrow. That there are topics that yes, I can definitely study today and I can definitely explore today. And there are topics that really, I, just, I have to wait till later. Maybe I have to wait till I have more resource, more human resources to work with, or I have more capital resources to work with, or I have more education, I mean, uh, stronger educational background to develop. Um, there are multiple, multiple factors that can lead into a change of topic. But sometimes also it's saying, again, there are topics that from that particular angle are, there is saturation. So why add to the saturation on a topic by going with the same angle when you can maybe add another dimension to the topic? Just because it's saturated doesn't mean it's not worth studying it. But if a topic, if a particular approach to a problem is being saturated, it, it's important to justify the, the need for a change of perspective or a need for a change of, an ang a change of angle, the need for a change of pers um, scenery. So that the literature review, recognizing what people have done in the field, helps me, rec um, helps me make sense of this. Um, then it says, yeah, supporting the purpose of the study. So is my study relevant? Is my study interesting? Is my study worth doing? It's something that on the one hand, yes, there is a lot of my own intuition that falls into that. Like, I mean, I, and as a researcher, you know, sometimes if you know the field, well enough, or if you explore the field carefully enough, you can find that the purpose of the study is justified. But just saying, Oh, I think it should be. I think this the study is relevant just by, by myself. Sometimes it's not gonna be enough. And um, yeah, and again, Connor and I mean Connor and Duncan are making a little bit of a pre the presence felt into this webinar because we're all here together. You know, you know what the situation is. Um, so um, I, I my apologies for the occasional barking that could happen during the webinar. So, as I said, it's important to support the purpose of your study. And it's very important to have to really locate that purpose within the larger body of work. Sometimes it's in whether you go into a topic that has been explored at length or you go and you develop a topic that is going to be a new angle on the particular, on a particular theme. The literature review gives you the clues on, um, on how to go in that direction. Um, point D is very important. The idea of identifying gaps in the literature. Because when we do a study, when we work on a study, um, it's important to know where our study fits. Again, again, we go back to that, to that here. So it, if this is the study you want to do, you need to know that study, how it connects to the rest, to the larger body of work. I always like to say, and uh, I always like to explain that the literature review um, has to address three things. Uh, it depends on the level of complexity. It has to address at least two and then going into the third. So first, you have to account for what people have done. So you have to account for what people have done. You have to account for the studies that exist and what we have learned from those particular studies. So what are looking at the main trends, looking at the main issues, looking at the main questions that we have addressed. Then there is a second level 
is something we call finding the blank spots. Finding the blank spots. So those are the gaps in the literature. The gaps in the literature are on the one hand, the blank spots. So those places that we have already determined um, are topics that we need to pursue further. And we said, and it's, it's those are easy to find in the um, in a research program you know, like within the literature, because in many cases um, you're gonna find them already. The article when we talk about future research, um, may make suggestions for more inquiry, or they tell you what they were not able to do. And sorry, uh, what the what on earth happened here? Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that, um, little glitches that happen um, in live webinars. So the blank spots, as I was saying, are those places that the literature has already detected are further areas of inquiry. And those are very important because finding those gaps, again, back to this, it means that this, you can find where this is going to connect with the rest of the structure. There is a third element um, that usually I would say, I mean, sometimes in master's thesis is not necessarily the goal. That's more the goal of um, when you want to pursue um, a dissertation. And it's looking for what we call the blind spots. So I say blank spots are things that we know there's still, uh, there are gaps, but there are gaps that we have already detected. The blind spots on the other hand are um, gaps in the literature that maybe we haven't noticed. And in your review, you can, you can start noticing, okay, they have done this, but they haven't, they haven't mentioned the possibility of doing that. And maybe your work fits within the possibility of that area that has not been mentioned yet. It's a difficult, it's a difficult goal, but it's not impossible. And in fact, I, I argue that that is the main the main objective of um, like the, of writing a dissertation. It's the idea that oh, you can start helping with the blind spots. If you cannot go, I mean, at this particular stage, if you cannot get there, it's perfectly okay. What's important is really identify this point D, recognize the gaps in the literature, and from the gaps in the literature find where your study fits. Maybe you cannot address every imaginable gap. And I don't think any one study can fill all the gaps. That's why we have multiple studies in, a, in, in, a different, in different fields. To, together, together as a community of practice and a community of knowledge, we can fill those gaps together. Um, then the idea of becoming aware of variables relevant to the problem. So, it's, again, it goes back into the trends, into the main issues that we want to highlight in, as in the studies we're, um, we're pursuing. So what are the things that are relevant? And are those things kind of, are, are those things part of the uh, discussions in the literature? Um, point F, yes, understanding the key studies, why decided. So, Who's, I mean, it's important when you are, and this is the part, which one of the sparks for the, uh, the literature review helps complement the conceptual framework in whichever, whichever direction you go. Um, and it's, as you read, it's important to recognize whose work is being cited. It's important to recognize in your field whose work is being cited most often. And it's important to recognize uh, if you find that there is a certain author or a certain group of authors that are appearing recurrently in the articles you're reviewing, then that is a clue. That's a clue that maybe that's an author I need to read. That maybe that's an author I need to go and back go and take a look at because that author may be an important, an essential part of my conceptual framework. And sometimes it's important if you notice, and this is in, yeah, if you find that this author X or author Y that appears recurrently in the review and you haven't read any work from that author, you need to kind of 
make a make like a little pit stop and go back and trace the work from that author. If I mean, and you don't necessarily just because the, all the studies cited that work, it doesn't mean you have to cite it in yours. You can make the choice. And then we talked about um, last night about the choices we make. So you can make the choice not to cite author X, author Y, or author Z. As a scholar, and this is important again for not only for um, the students, but for the um, young scholars who are listening to this spot, who are listening to the, um, to the webinar. Being a scholar is all about making choices. So a lot of the things that I mean, we do as, a, as scholars is just make choices. We make choices of the concepts we want to build our agenda from. We make choices about the authors we want to cite. We make choices about the articles we want to read. It's all about making choices. So scholarship and becoming a scholar is about making choices, but making choices that you can support. So you can choose and any, you can ask any scholar, who are the three, four, five people that have become foundational in the work? We all have authors in our work who are foundational. We all have scholars who are inspirational to our own scholarship and inspirational to our own writing. And we have all made choices. And what's important is to be able to defend your choices, to justify and explain your choices. Make choices, and that's important. Just, just know, know how to justify them. If everybody's citing one author and you're not working with that author, it's your choice. Just make sure that your choice is not, it's founded on the knowledge of the literature in the field, that it's founded on your understanding of the field and you don't, and the way you want to position yourself in the field, not simply make it a reactionary because I don't like that person. Don't know. Maybe there are, you know, think of the bigger reasons. I mean, there are authors you may not like on a personal level, but whose work can be helpful. Not understanding that if there are big epistemological conflicts, then you should really not cite that person because especially in certain topics, there are philosophical views that are going to really affect their own, your own construction of your ideas. But it's important to know you need to know, even if you don't cite them, even if you don't use them, it's very important when you're beginning to find yourself in a new field that you know who the key players are. Again, even if you don't cite them and you don't have to cite anyone just because everybody else is, but you need to know their work. You need to know they exist. It, so that way you can justify your choices. And again, it's all about the choices you make and how you support the choices you're making. Um, the part, again, uh, we say here, um, so it's F and G, leading scholars relevant to the problem, um, proposing useful theoretical constructs for the study. So the lit review and the, and the um, conceptual framework are very, very connected. Um, there are two possible ways to do the, the work of the lit review. Some people first in the survey literature related to the problem, and then they use the literature to choose the conceptual framework they want to develop in the project. Others say, well, you have the problem. Let's think about the potential schools of thought and theories that can illustrate and inform the question. And then we're going to look at the literature that has talked about those concepts. Both avenues are equally valid. I, for me, as a scholar, I always go from the, from the problem to the question to the conceptual framework, and then I survey the literature in relation to the framework. I know other people who do the other way around, and when we have our guests, we're going to definitely throw that question to them. Which way they go, uh, how they approach the connection between the framework and the, uh, and the lit review and how the students approach it, just to see there are, that there are multiple ways to get into that. But again, even no matter the direction you go, you go um, and whether you first write a conceptual framework and then you do a review or vice versa, the lit review in illustrates 
the potential for the conceptual framework. So it because you, even even if you do the like literally after you do the framework, whatever you find in terms of the theoretical constructs here, you can always go back and revise your conceptual framework. The conceptual framework are in constant revision, in, are in mutual revision. They always go back and forth. And that, <laughs> sorry about that. And that is important in this construction. Just because you wrote the framework doesn't mean you just go into the lit review just like that. No, you go back, you have to go back and review. And you got to go back and revisit what you wrote in each of those um, two sections. And again, once you have the framework and the lit review, you need to go back to the problem because there may be things in the literature review that help you il illuminate um, the nature of the problem. Um, point A, um, I is a very important one. Um, and this is something that when you write your lit review, you might, you, you need to make sure that this appears in your document, at least in the case of our students. And it's that the application of appropriate methodological procedures. There is a connection, as we said last night, that a, the, the conceptual framework serves as an analytical lens that informs the methodology. There is a direct connection between the literature review and the methodology of your study. Um, especially, and I've said especially, especially for beginner researchers, um, that those questions you were asking, I mean, the question you were asking last night about what, what would be the best data sources or the best forms of data analysis for my work. Um, the good news is that you don't always have to start thinking from scratch. The good news is the lit review is gonna give you a lot of clues about what the methodology for your study is gonna look like. Because one of the things you're going to look in your lit review is you're going to look at the, what we call the methodological considerations for your study. Meaning when you do, when you review and you survey the studies that you might um, choose for your project, take a very good look at what they did in the methodology. So take a good look at the kind of studies they are. Are they descriptive studies? Are they exploratory studies? Are they doing case studies? Are they doing action research? Uh, are they narrative studies? I mean, like, what kind of study is it? Because the stat, because um, yeah, the literature should tell you what they did, and we need to make a good, um, make a, a decent, a good or a decent account of what we did in terms of methodology. So that will help you. So look at the kind of study they did. Look at where they did it. If you have a particular st group of studies in your field that's saying, "Oh, we did research in schools." Um, it's that, I mean, it probably means that you should also go into school because the school might be the best place to get the, uh, to get the data. And I, I think this in studies, there are places where it's important to um, question or, or go against the grain or make raise a lot of questions. And there are places where sometimes let the common sense of the literature tell you this is, this is maybe, this is maybe a good way to go. So look at the choices they make, look at the kind of data they collected. Um, if there are things that are important, that are useful, that you found, for example, surveys or, or interview questions in an article, um, and you wanna play, you wanna use them, my recommendation in that case would be email the, write, write back to the, um, to the author of the article. Tell them who you are, explain that you've read the article and that you would like to use their interview protocol or their survey or, or their technique in your study. And I can assure you most of the scholars would not say no, especially if they get an, an, an email from a young, um, from a grad student, from a young scholar saying I read your paper and I would like to use some of the ideas. They'll probably, they'll probably say yes. And more like more, more often than not, they might even give you ideas on how to do it, how to take it to the next level. And that I, I know from personal experience, I, I did that. I contacted people when I was working on my dissertation and they were all very gracious to send me, not even to say, yes, you can 
use that, but many of them sent me drafts and they sent me more examples of surveys. Like, yeah, look, I mean, we have this, um, feel free to use it. Because we all know that part of building knowledge is being part of a community. And that, although it's not here in the document itself, in the definition itself, is one of the reasons we do the lit review. It's so we can find, we can realize that our research is part of a community, that we are, in fact, the moment we start doing research, we belong to a community, a community where there are people who are experts, people who are beginners, people who are somewhere in the middle, people with some expertise in some areas and people with expertise in others, and that the best thing we can do in order to really push knowledge in uh, push knowledge forward is to help each other and be willing to give each other a hand and be willing to talk to each other um, as, as we go. And the last point, looking at comparative studies that assist in analyzing your data and interpreting the results. Again, part of doing the lead review is not simply to say, oh, this is what people have done but it's also to say, oh, this is what I could do too. Your studies are gonna have certain levels of originality and they're going to be original in, their, in the conception of the problem, in the question they propose, in the, in the site, in the participants, but you don't have, not everything in your studies, and this is very important. I want all, my, all the students to listen to this carefully. And again, people who are following, um, the webinar, not everything you're going to do is gonna be original because you're giving it the twist. You do, you're trying this out in a different location with different students. Original doesn't mean unprecedented or never tested. That is a different level of originality that requires uh, a very different level of experimentation. Originality here means trying these things that have happened before, replicate, so even replication is originality. Even if someone takes a conceptual framework that you created and they use it in a different city or in a different country, that there is originality because they are giving new variations to the frameworks. So even if you draw ideas from another, from another framework and ideas from a different, a methodological approach, the fact that you're doing it in your school, in your place, in your city, it adds a layer of originality. And, but it also sets it that it's original, but it's not so, it is unique, but in the sense of it's unique because I'm doing it here, not unique because as we said in the first class, no one, it hasn't happened to anybody. Remember studies cannot be so idiosyncratic that you cannot compare situations across contexts. If your study is so particular to one context, really your study is not, it's not helping support, I mean, identify gaps in literature, it's not helping push the field forward. Um, so those are considerations that you want to keep in mind when you are constructing the literature review. Understanding that part of, doing the lead review is doing the homework. I remember that my, when I was in school, they always told me that one of the objectives of doing the lead review is proving that you did the homework. It's proving that you did the work, that you read, that you studied, and that you know exactly what is happening and that you know exactly what people are doing in your particular field of work. So that's why we do the literature review. We do the literature review in order to have a sense of what's going on in the field. Um, because otherwise constructing a study just like that, it's gonna be very difficult. So it's important to know that to, on, and, now, there are other questions when it comes to the lit review. Um, 
that we have to consider, okay, so what studies are, what, what are we gonna survey? And those are technical matters. Okay, what are we gonna survey? Can, um, are we gonna survey just in, in, in the articles? Are we gonna look at great literature? Are you gonna look at reports? Are we gonna look at dissertations and master's theses? Um, it all gonna, it's all gonna depend, first of all, on the problem, but there is more often than not a kind of like a, some sort of consensus that the, the starting point should be the peer reviewed articles. And the reason we agree that peer reviewed articles should be the starting point is because their the articles have been go, have, have gone through a, a particular process of evaluation where experts in the field have said this article has a valuable contribution to the field and therefore should be published. Um, so my suggestions go for peer reviewed journals and be careful here not to always not to conflate peer reviewed and indexed journals. Indexation is a process that takes several years and it's also about the number of citations of a journal, but there are journals that have been around for less than five or six years who may not necessarily be, not necessarily be indexed, but they're peer reviewed. So we always talk about peer review as the main standard because not every peer reviewed journal is an indexed journal. Indexation again is the result of uh, time, presence, and number of citations. So it's a different, those are different factors. What you wanna make sure is that the journals you review, they guarantee you that there is a process of peer review. It means someone submitted the article and there were one, two or three people we consider to have certain levels of expertise in that particular field that read this and made recommendations and it went through a process where this departed and the author has to do some revisions and send it again. And finally, the article sees the light of day. Um, now, how about, can we look at book chapters? Can we look at, yes, you can. I mean, more, usually book chapters sometimes are also peer reviewed. Um, if, if, it's re if it's relevant for the work. Um, but it's important to make, to really outline those decisions early on. So if I'm just gonna look at peer review journals then make it explicit. If I'm gonna look at uh, journals and other things, make it explicit. Um, but it's, so that, so that way you can, you can actually justify the decisions you make. Um, choose a timeline. You cannot review everything that has been written. And you have to keep your timelines realistic. Um, so saying, I'm just gonna review the articles from last year, that's not gonna give you much. Um, but I'm saying, I'm gonna review the articles for the last 30 years. Like, well, is it really necessary to review 30 years of literature? If what you're doing is a meta-analysis, a research synthesis, not just a literature review for a um, for a field-based study, if you're going to do like actually something much larger, something we call a meta-analysis or research synthesis, you may have to read 20 to 30 years of literature. But it's not, but I would say a, um, a sensible timeline for your work, it would be 10 years. 10 years is a very sensible timeline because you're going to have a lot of articles to review in those 10 years anyway. That's going to be in 10 years of literature. It means you're going to have to, I mean, you can read, you can survey, not even read, but survey somewhere north of 300, 400 articles. And by survey, I mean looking at the title, looking at the abstract, and looking at the references. <laughs> just survey the articles. Just looking at the titles alone, it can, you can read up to 600, 700, 1,000 titles as you're working in a literature review in order to choose the articles you finally want to choose. So that, but so 10, if you say like a 10 year window, it's a reasonable window, uh, especially for studies of your nature. Um, it's important in the case, in our case, uh, I would strongly recommend looking at different at articles from different regions of the world um, and definitely look at in our field, at different articles that are uh, from Latin America, because sometimes we fall prey to the mistake of just looking at high impact journals from other parts of the world and we neglect 
the scholarship that is happening in Latin America. And there are, a lot, I mean, at least in our field, there are a number of journals in TESOL, applied linguistics, language education, language studies, that also have very, very high quality articles. So it's not, it's not a good idea to disregard the literature, um, explore all the databases. It's, it's fundamental to explore the databases. In our case, remember that the unit, I mean, we have within the university um, an extended database, extended databases where we have multiple um, search engines. Um, look at those. Don't disregard open access journals. Open access journals are very important and they and you can find very interesting articles in open access journals. Um, just remember that in the case of Latin America, a lot of our journals are open access. So it just it's just a matter of digging. It's just a matter of just taking your time to look at the articles and survey the literature. All, it's also important to define, uh, as we said last, I mean, kind of tying to what we said last week, I mean, sorry, last class, we said last class. Um, it's important to set those boundaries in terms of, the, of things. So if you're looking at, if your study is situated on, sec on secondary education, looking at studies on elementary education might not, necess might not be necessary. And you just should just probably focus first on the studies that are secondary education, and then maybe take a quick look at elementary, uh, just in case there are exceptional studies. And sometimes you can have an exceptional study that happened that uh, was in the preschool setting that can help you inform um, a study on secondary education. But keep your, keep the, con make it very, keep those, and it's important to set those boundaries because again, you're gonna have to survey, again, not even read, but survey a great number of articles. And I have a comment here from, it's also important to keep the record of those journals and keep the articles classified. Yes, uh, Claudia, one of our professors in the MLP programs just commented on the chat. So yeah, and it's very important to be organized. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the success of your research work is going to depend on organization. So make sure you really keep a good, um, or I mean, you keep a good storage of the articles and a good storage of the uh, of your ideas and the notes you've taken. Because then trying to put them to bring them together is going to become might be more complicated than you thought it was. So always do that. Keep. No, I mean, know exactly what everything is. <laughs> that's, a, that's one of the keys to the success of your research endeavor, knowing where, every, where everything is located, because otherwise um, it becomes a little more, it's going to become a lot more complicated um, to finish the review. Now, one final, because I think, I think we're, uh, in a few, a few minutes, we're going to have our guests um, showing up, and then we'll just um, open for larger conversation. Um, but one important thing, and this is um, there's a big difference between making what you call an annotated bibliography and a literature review. Um, and in the case of the class, um, you have an assignment that is an annotated bibliography. So I, don't know, I mean, annotated bibliography is making a list of the articles and summarizing and making summaries of the articles that you plan to use. A lit review, it's not simply making lists of summaries. A lit review, and I'm going to go back to the, um, to the image of the day. A literature review is this, it's creating connections, it's creating clusters. It's connecting ideas across the different articles you read in relation to the topic. It's not going and making three paragraphs and three paragraphs. I mean, someone knows. It's not extended summaries of articles. It's how you connect the articles in relation to the topic that you're exploring, in relation to the conceptual, to the frameworks that you're developing. 
So a lot of a lot of what you're going to do in the in the literature review is going to be not simply summarizing the articles, but make establishing connections, establishing connections between the articles. Just to see, okay, what and what like the question is, what am I learning about these articles in relation to the question? That's kind of like the question that you want to address within the study or within this, with the creation of the literature review. Why am I learning in relation to the topic I want to study as I look at the literature? What are the themes? What are the trends? What are the clusters that I'm finding? And that, how I connect, how I go back and I connected to the problem and I connected to the question and I connected to um, the, liter the, the literature in general. But don't go into those, again, again, that's a, that's a tactical mistake, though. It's a tactical approach um, of summarizing and summarizing and summarizing and summarizing. No. You, might, you may include short summaries as you talk about the groups, but you don't have to go and summarize Article 1, Article 2, Article 3, Article 4, Article 5. No. That is not a literature review. Just as we said last, uh, last night, that listing theories does not make a literature um, a conceptual framework, it's just how you integrate them in relation to the question and the problem. Just listing articles does not make a literature review. It's how you connect the articles in relation to the question and the problem, what constitutes the literature review. So always keep that in mind. Um, before, and again, it should be a matter of time till we have our guests, so before um, we welcome them. I'm wondering if you have any, if there are any questions from any of you at this point. If anybody has any questions you want to ask at this particular point, you're more than welcome. Roll. Hello. Manuela has a question, so yes, go ahead, Manuela. Hold on. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry, hold on. Yes, Manuela. You can go ahead and ask the question. Hello. Rob. Hello, Edison. Yes. Uh, I don't know if Manuela is going to answer, but I have another question. Okay. Yeah, Raul, uh, in this case, for example, how could we identify good literature for including in our literature review? I mean, because there are a lot of websites or, or database bases for contrasting different information, but how could we identify that, that those, those big literature is important for our, for our work? Okay, uh, well, Manuela, we couldn't hear you, but I think your microphone is already on. So after I answer Jason's question, we can um, we can make the we can um, open the floor for you. Um, here, the first thing, Edison, you have to in one of the standards, and again, we can throw the question again to our guests when they show up. But um, that's why I said one of the usual um, things that we do when it, we're doing a lit review, it's we mostly um, focus on like uh, peer reviewed journals or like uh, sometimes you can include a master, you can include master's thesis or dissertations. Um, yeah. Just looking at websites themselves, unless, um, unless this is like a repute, I mean, it's a blog that um, you can trace back the people who did it. And there are blogs that are like hosted by research labs and yeah, um, and, and even even it is corpus or some specific websites that we determine the level of research that yeah, but you have to care be careful because um things like scopus or way of science, they're not going they um they're very stringent in the sense that they only recognize peer-reviewed journals. So if okay. you just go into the direction of oh, if you look at what scopus scopus is only gonna recognize uh, yeah. either peer-reviewed journals or certain book chapters or certain proceedings, uh, conference proceedings, but they're not gonna give you, they're not gonna, they're not gonna um, like rank or give you credit for a blog post. So okay. blog posts are something you wanna take with a grain of salt and you have to be careful 
not to not I mean you can include them at different in different places of your technical proposal, but don't make that the bulk the bulk of your of the work that you're using to justify your study mm -hmm. because that's problematic. Equally problematic is yeah, same with great literature. You can use great literature. And even a lead review, you can use great literature. There are working paper series around the world. Uh, and many of them just publish, for example, for early drafts of, pub of future publications. And you can use them, absolutely. But that cannot be the bulk. Yeah. And definitely careful not to be, not to be using unpublished manuscripts at any point, especially unpublished manuscripts of your own at any point to justify your work. That is, that is also, I mean, that's also not a very good move. Uh, it raises a lot of red flags. So I've seen some people do that and that raises a lot of red flags. If, if, that, if that paper is so relevant for your work, then make sure you have it published somehow, even if it's like a worst case scenario, and you just post it on um, like a, the ERIC database or something like that, or a conference proceeding or something like that. If you cannot make it into, into a peer reviewed article, make sure it appears somewhere. Because when you say it's unpublished, it means nobody can read it. We cannot, we cannot mm -hmm. certify, we cannot, you cannot provide evidence that that article is as useful as you claim it is. Because you say, and I've seen people write, because I, oh, um, yeah, da, 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 my name, unpublished manuscript. Like, <laughs> wait, why are you using unpublished manuscripts as the, found, as the building block of your, of your research? That is not a good idea. Same as, for example, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use articles under review, uh, in preparation. No, article in preparation is not, it's the same as a, as a peer review, sorry, as, um, as an unpublished manuscript. Can I use articles under review? Yes, and we have a first guest coming, so uh, I'll answer this question and then we'll start welcoming everybody.